Good morning, church, and welcome to our eighth online service together. It's Mother's Day today, and so I want to begin by saying Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers who are joining us online today. Um, many of us have really rich relationships with our mum, and today is an opportunity for us to just give thanks for their presence in our lives. Some of us are mums, and so I hope this morning if you're a mum, you have um, received some gift, some token of thanks and love from your kids, whether it's a homemade card or perhaps some flowers, or maybe if you're under the same roof, breakfast in bed, if you're particularly lucky. Some of us uh, haven't been able to see our mums, perhaps for weeks, um, or to hug them because of social isolation. And so if you're a mum this morning who is feeling disconnected from their kids because of the social distancing measures that we have in place, I just want to pray this morning that you will really sense God's comfort and his delight in you. Some of us uh, find Mother's Day a really hard or painful day. For some of us, we have a broken relationship with our mum. For others of us, Mother's Day is a painful day. Some of us have broken relationships with our mums. For others of us, our mothers are no longer in this world and Mother's Day is a painful reminder of their absence in our lives. Some of us have never been able to become mums who have deeply wanted to. And so I pray that for those of us for whom today is a difficult day, that you also would really sense God's comfort of you. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew 23 where he talks about longing to gather his children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And I really pray that you will sense that maternal part of his parental care for us today. As we begin this morning and prepare our time of worship and to hear from God's word, I want to ask you a question. I wonder what this coronavirus pandemic, what longings it has really heightened within you. Perhaps it's a longing to really see an end to the sickness and suffering and death that we have seen in so many parts of the world. Perhaps it's a longing to be able to get back into work. Perhaps it's a longing to be able to see and hug someone that is dear to you that you haven't been able to see or hug for weeks, perhaps months. Maybe it's smaller things like a a restart to the football season (laughs) or being able to plan to travel or perhaps just even to make plans in the near-term future at all. We live in a society and a culture where it is easy for us to get access to the things that we want, often instantly. And I think for many of us, longing is sort of a new feeling that we're having to come to terms with. But the biblical authors were really familiar with the concept of longing. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship this morning, I want to draw us to Psalm 63, where David describes his longing in the desert. He says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you for as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Let's pray together this morning. Our God, in this season of restriction, we thank you for the reminder that even in dry and weary places, you satisfy more than the richest feast. Lord, this morning we turn our longing hearts toward you. We thank you for your unfailing love. And we thank you for your promise that one day you will return and end all sickness and death and suffering and uncertainty and we will see you face to face 
and we will be with you and you will make everything new. And we thank you that as we wait for that great day, you indwell us by your spirit and give us the promise of your presence with us. Today, teach us to worship you afresh as our good, gracious and generous King. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, I want to invite you now to pause the video and click on the links below and join us as we worship. Good morning, church. Please join me as we pray to our great God this morning. As Psalm 145 declares, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Lord, we give you praise for you are forever gracious and your mercy is over all that you have made. We praise you for your slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We give you all the praise, honour and glory for you are faithful in word and you are righteous in all your ways. Lord, we praise you for your kingdom is everlasting and your dominion endures through all generations. We exalt your name and may we bless your holy name forever and ever. Father God, we give you thanks for your love for us, a love that is beyond our comprehension and cannot be measured, a love that has been lavished upon us, so much so that we should be called children of God. We thank you for your grace, your grace that is sufficient, that was apportioned by Christ and that forgives us and saves us. We give you thanks for your word, your word that is alive and active. We thank you for the hope that we have found in Christ Jesus and for the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells within us and speaks truth. Today we give you thanks for your goodness and faithfulness to us. Thankful that we can stand firm in faith and reassurance that you are God over all things. At a time in this world where there is so much uncertainty, we know and thank you that you never change, you never fail, and you never leave us. God, we are thankful for so much, and we give you thanks for this new day, this time to worship you, and this opportunity to come before you with our requests, of which we bring some of these to you now. Lord, on this day as we remember mothers among us, we give you thanks for each one. Lord, we would ask that you would strengthen each of them in all that they do. We pray you would grant them wisdom to share with each of their children. May those that feel weary find rest in your presence today. We think of all the motherly figures in our lives, whether they be grandmothers, aunts, sisters, wives, stepmothers, guardians, and many others of whom we love. We give you thanks for each of them, their compassion, their trust, their self-sacrifice, and their positive influence. We lift up all of them to you and we pray for your continued blessing over their lives. May they know not only our love for them, but your love for them. We also pray that you will bring peace and comfort to those who may, for many reasons, find today difficult. Whether it be pain or loss or grief or isolation, Lord, you know our hearts and needs and we give them to you today. Father, at this time and in the current situation that surrounds the COVID-19 pandemic, we also pray for your continued perfect, uh, protection around our church family. We pray against any form of spiritual attack from the enemy that may deter, hinder or distract us in our relationship with you and those around us. As your people, I pray that our focus, our eyes will remain firmly fixed on you, that there will be no doubt, that there will be no fear and that there will be no question that you are the supreme ruler, authority and power at this time. We also pray for good health and well-being for those in our church community and safekeeping over each one. Lord, we bring before you the leaders of each state and for this country. In particular, we pray for the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and we ask that you give him the strength to continue to lead and pray that he'll be supported by the right people and right information to continue navigating the challenging circumstances. As the National Cabinet continues to meet and make decisions in relation to the current pandemic, we ask you grant them wisdom in their decisions. We thank you for the progress that has been made in the, min the minimisation 
of transmissions of the virus and for the lives that have been saved. Lord, may the lifting and easement of restrictions be done timely, safely and purposefully. At this time, we continue to lift up the elderly, the vulnerable, those in need and those who need special assistance and pray that you would grant them the right support and protection. Lord, for those that have been impacted economically by loss of work or income, we pray that they will seek you for their provision and that, they will, that you will provide all their needs. As a global situation continues to unfold, Lord, we pray that the reach of your gospel message will continue to go far and wide through this time. We pray that your name will be lifted up and glorified in homes throughout this world. Lord, we pray that your name is lifted high in worship, your word is preached, and that lives will be changed, restored and renewed, that there may be a multitude of people that come to know Christ through all that is being distributed throughout the internet and TV. Lord, we pray that this will be a time where your church unifies and that, uh, and that it is all done for your glory. May it be a time where believers unite in prayer, in worship and in proclaiming your word to see your kingdom grow and expand. In what is a difficult time for many, we pray for all those around this world that may be grieving the loss of a loved one, a family member, a friend. We pray for a sense of peace and comfort and we pray that they'll be able to grieve their loss in a dignified way. God, for those with the skills and knowledge to administer health services, create vaccines and provide care for those with mental illness, we ask that you would give them the strength to continue to do the work that is needed, that they would seek you to be the one that sustains them and that you would lead and guide them through every case and every challenge. We thank you for their gifts, their skills, their abilities and pray that you would give them wisdom in all decisions relating to preservation of lives and future vaccines. God, as we lift up these requests to you this morning, we know that you are the God of all, who loves us, who knows our hearts and hears our prayers. We commit all to you and we place our trust and confidence in you, the one true living God. In the mighty, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Morley Baptist Church Online, once again church. It's lovely to have you with us this morning. There's a really important step in the whole dating process. As soon as I mention this, I know you're going to remember, of it. Re remember it. Some of you will remember it painfully. There comes a moment in a new relationship where you know you've reached the time where you have to introduce your new boyfriend or girlfriend to your parents. Do you remember that? Remember what it was like? And so the family dinner is arranged, the date is set, uh, dinner's laid out, and uh, the new boyfriend or the new girlfriend is coming around to meet the family. How are they going to go meeting the parents? Will he burp and slurp and say inappropriate things, you know? Will she dress up too much? Will she dress up too little? Uh, will she be too outspoken? on taboo topics, or will she wa say wildly divergent things on, on hot topics? How's it going to go? Uh, do you remember that time? I, I remember uh, as a young man, fresh out of high school actually, having that first introduction to Ali's family back in 1984, perhaps it was. Uh, failed dismally, oh my goodness. Um, had the social skills of a gnat, farm boy from Wagen, as I was. Still amazed, actually, that the family let me in. Did much better all those years later when I was uh, uh, getting ready and, and forming the new relationship with Sarah. In fact, I was the one that pulled out a piece of paper and wrote down the five-stage process, the praying, testing, uh, the the courtship, the engagement, the marriage, you know, complete with diagrams, arrows. I think I even began to verbally process some of the actual proposal. Sarah's going, don't do it now, don't do it now. It's uh, an essential test. And uh, what are you looking for in that test? It, it's all about compatibility. But in particular, you're wanting to find out how does this new prospective partner fit with the, and here's the key word, the tradition of our family. Do they fit in with it? Do they mesh with it? 
Uh, is, is there going to be wildly divergent views or will they honour something of our heritage? Will they be able to fit in with it? Some of you remember that from uh, the distant past. For some of you, it will be quite recent. Some of you young fellas are taking notes right now, aren't you? Must meet the parents, you know, be polite, don't slurp, you know. It's uh, an important test that you can apply to relationships. Testing compatibility, meet the mum and dad. It doesn't only apply in relationships. It's also a really important test when it comes to evaluating new leaders or movements. So uh, a new leader or movement is taking the world by storm and what you've got to do is run the uh, meet the parents test past it and just ask of this new movement, does it honour any of the tradition of the past or is it so novel and so radical that it's actually broken step with all of past tradition and it's just setting itself up as a new authority. Uh, typically, that's a warning sign. If a new leader or a new movement has no sense of continuity with historic Christianity or apostolic faith, dangerous. If it's a fresh expression, wonderful. But if there's no sense of honouring the past, ah, that's, that's a warning sign. I think it's exactly this point that Jesus is speaking to as we come to this next passage in the Sermon on the Mount. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, we're three weeks into a series for the term looking at uh, Kingdom 101, the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through to 7. And we're looking at this uh, message of Jesus as he unfolds his Gospel of the Kingdom. Today we come to a time where I think he's speaking to this very objection and question that would have been brewing in people's minds. You see, Jesus has been creating an incredible stir. Uh, the message he's been preaching, uh, the way that he's been healing and performing miraculous deeds, uh, people have flocked from afar and every Jew that comes to listen to Jesus will have this question foremost in their minds, Will he pay respect to our age-old traditions? Because every Jew knew God was the one who gave our scriptures. God was the one who chose our nation. Our history and heritage and legacy is from God. Along comes a new teacher. Well, they'll be new, but will they be so new, so radical, so novel, that they break with that, or will they honour it? Will he dismiss it or will he recognise it and esteem it? This is precisely what Jesus is speaking to in this passage. So if you've got your Bibles, grab them, uh, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the first uh, Gospel account in the New Testament. And we're picking up verses 17 to 20, and that's what we're going to focus on most. Uh, I will dip into the couple of paragraphs after verse 20, but we're going to try and confine ourselves just to 17 to 20. It's asking the whole question, does Jesus pass the meet your mother test? And just so you know up front, he passes with flying colours. Let's read. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, let's look at this passage. I want to break it into two parts. The first two verses, verses 17 and 18, is where Jesus speaks to his passing the test. The test of how does he fit with Old, Old Testament tradition, with the law. That's verses 17 and 18. 
And then in the last two verses of this, verses 19 and 20, he actually shifts the focus not to how he fulfills the law, but what's his expectation of his followers, uh, followers in the kingdom. What's their relationship with the law? Do they pass the test? So let's have a look at this. Firstly, for Jesus passing the meet your mother test, he is saying that uh, his movement stands in continuity with God's previous revelation. So let's define some terms for a start. He refers to the law and the prophets. Now what's he talking about when he talks about the law and the prophets? What is this? That's shorthand for our Old Testament scriptures, the first three quarters of our Bible. So the law um, refers to the, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, written by Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Pentateuch, five, Penta, Pentateuch, or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the Torah. But those first five books uh, relay the story of the creation of God, uh, our fall into sin, the flood, the Tower of Babel, and then the way that God chose Abraham as the leader of a new nation. And the storyline follows that family line for the rest of those uh, four and a half books. And so it's Abraham's line. It's the Hebrews. And that little family line becomes a nation. They end up in slavery down in Egypt. God hears their groanings. He comes to rescue them through the hand of Moses. He delivers them out from a Pharaoh's regime in Egypt, brings them safely through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, brings them to the foot of Mount Sinai. There's 1.2 million odd group of uh, once slaves, but now a redeemed people. And there at the foot of Mount Sinai, God does a new thing with this nation. He says, I have rescued you. You are my treasured possession. All the nations in the world are mine, but I'm making you my precious possession. He says, I'm going to establish a covenant with you. He initiates it. They didn't. He does. This is God establishing a covenant with this nation. And then he says, now here are the terms of the covenant. And you'll know them. Ten big commandments, right? They were the terms of this covenant that God had with this nation. The Ten Commandments, the law. Now that's just the first ten. Uh, people have calculated there's another 603 after that throughout those first five books as it just follows the way that they set up their, their whole system of the tabernacle, sacrifices, priests. They wander through the wilderness. They finally come to the border. Moses gives them their swan song and then he dies and it passes in into the rest of the Old Testament history as Joshua takes them into the promised land. But those first five books often will get called the law. Because even though their story, it's not all law, but their primarily story, there's 613 laws, commands, where God is giving his instructions to his covenant people. I've made you my own, and this is how I want you to be a distinct people. The law expresses God's will for his people. He saved them. He's rescued them. He's covenanted himself to them. He says, now this is my will for you to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. So that's the law. The prophets come later. So in our English Bibles, uh, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. There's three major ones. And they're major not because they are heavyweights, but because their, their um, writings were longer. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They were uh, major prophets. Then there's about a baker's dozen, 13 minor prophets. Sometimes Daniel's included, sometimes he's not. But there's 13 of those minor prophets. Those prophets are sent by whom? By God. <laughs> God is uh, calling these prophets to announce God's word to his people. And it's sort of dual-sided. Sometimes those prophets will say, you are breaking God's covenant, his commandments. You have violated the covenant. That means you're going to bring upon yourself dire consequences. And for that nation of Israel, those dire consequences were that they would be exiled from their promised land. Uh, they would be taken away by a foreign nation. And, uh, and that's precisely what happened. 
But the other part of the prophet's message is that they gave promises and they spoke in such wonderful ways of the way that God would step in to restore, to renew, to recreate and to bring these people back into their land and renew them, restore them. And they had all of these wonderful promises. So the law reveals the will of God for his people. The prophets reveal the promises of God for his people. That first covenant people, the nation of Israel. When Jesus refers to law and the prophets, that is just a little tagline, a a little label that covers the whole, really, of the Old Testament story. There's the Psalms and the poetry in there as well, the wisdom literature. But law and prophets is, is like a shorthand. To say this is the Old Testament tradition of how God has worked in our nation, in our history, in our our heritage, sorry, our venerated legacy of what God has done in us. So that's just defining law and prophets. There's another thing to define in this section. You notice in verse 19, it talks about not an iota, not a dot. What is that, right? What do your translations have? Have they got iotas and dots? Uh, Some of you have got the old King James will say a jot and a tittle. What is a jot and a tittle? Well, let me explain it. And there's uh, an illustration that can be on the PowerPoint too that you can actually see this. An iota refers to the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's just like a little wiggle. And it's about, I don't know, a quarter or fifth of the size of most of the Hebrew letters. And it's just a little wiggle at the top. It's the small, Yod. Um, I think it's the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. A, a tittle or a, a, what does this say in the ESV? Not a jot or a, sorry, not an iota or a dot. A, a dot is just a, a little marking on letters that would distinguish one letter from another. So there's an example on the slide that you'll see on the screen. So the difference between a a bait and a calf is just a little piece, a little marking, and it will distinguish one letter from another. It's kind of like the equivalent for our English. Uh, What's the difference between a lowercase l and a lowercase t? It's just a little marking. So Jesus is saying not the smallest letter, not the smallest part of a letter will pass. So those are important definitions. The law and the prophets... This uh, Old Testament history of God's dealings with the nation of Israel. The law expressing his will, the prophets expressing his promises. Not an iota, not a dot, that's referring to the smallest letter, the smallest part of a letter. So now let's have a look at this. What is Jesus saying in reference to God's prior revelation? How does Jesus stand in regards to the Old Testament? I wonder how you would think that Jesus stands In regard to the Old Testament. Does he dismiss it? Is he so radical? He says, yeah, well, you know, we had all that. But now uh, everything's new and I'm doing away with it. Dispensing it. Listen to what he says. Do not think. Do not think. In other words, it would be possible for you to think this. But do not think that I came or I have come to abolish. To annul the law and the prophets. To to dismiss them, to dismantle them and and treat them with disregard. Do not think that I've come to break connection with the law and the prophets. He says, for uh, for truly I say to you, uh, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them, to bring them to completion, to bring them to their intended goal. And all that was uh, anticipated through the will of God, the promises of God, I am here not to abolish it, not to dismantle it, but to bring it to its fruition and its intended completion. I am here to fulfill it. And so he says in verse 20, Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the smallest part of a letter will pass away, until all is accomplished. That Old Testament tradition, the will of God, the promises of God, revealed through that history, is as permanent as this heaven and earth. One day it will pass, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. 
that Jesus is speaking to its duration, its permanence. It's a very clear statement. If ever you wondered what Jesus' relationship is to the Old Testament, you can be assured. He came not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. So this is significant for us. His movement, his kingdom movement, is not so radical that it does away with all that God said in the past. But look for the ways that he'll bring it to fulfillment. That he'll bring all of what was laid down to its intended goal. This uh, speaks of the, the durability, the, uh, the, the reputation, the, the honoured state of what Jesus is doing. He's not a radical. Oh, he's a wonderful teacher, incredible power. But he, he is not breaking with the past. He's bringing it to its conclusion. So Jesus passes the test, verses 17 and 18. He says, don't you worry about that. I'm honouring the past. I'm bringing it to its intended end. But then he turns the focus to us. He says, the question is, do you pass the test? Uh, are my followers in this kingdom movement that I have begun, are you going to pass the test of honouring that past? And so let's have a look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus' kingdom followers need to exemplify those original intentions laid down. So notice in these two verses, there's actually three mentions of the kingdom of heaven. Being called least in the kingdom of heaven, being called great in the kingdom of heaven, and uh, needing a righteousness that exceeds her, the scribes and Pharisees, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking here in these verses about his followers getting into his kingdom movement and what position they occupy in his kingdom movement. And it all seems to be revolving around what is our approach as Jesus' followers to these commands that were laid down in the first three quarters of our Bible. What's our approach to it? And, and what's the quality of our life as we live out those commands with uh, an expression of righteousness, right living, doing the right thing as God intended? And so Jesus drops a bombshell in verse 20. He says, I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, who's he talking about there? Scribes were the scholars of the day. Uh, these were the people that spent their whole uh, working life studying the Hebrew scriptures. They were the professors. They were the ones that, that studied those scriptures. And they knew them and they taught them. The Pharisees were uh, a social pressure group really but they were very highly uh, respected they had an enormous concern for God's word and living it out um, scribes and Pharisees were the most meticulous of the Jews really in how they paid attention to following God's word uh, these were if you like the religious professionals so, put yourself on that hillside as Jesus says this, uh, overlooking the lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is talking to his followers, and he says, your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, what would the average person, the average punter think when they heard that saying? They'd be going, well, th this is gobsmacking. This is impossible. They're the professionals. What do you mean... Our righteousness has to exceed theirs. They do this for a living. The scribes study the scriptures all the time. The Pharisees are an esteemed community group who give such attention to uh, right living according to the, the law of God. What do you mean our righteousness has to exceed theirs? That's like saying, sure, you want to be part of this basketball team? No problem. Just dunk better than Michael Jordan. You want to be part of this AFL team? No worries. Just mark better than Jeremy McGovern and, and goal better than, than Josh Kennedy and rock better than Nick Nat. I'm showing my colours here. Can't wait till it gets back. But you get the picture, right? It sounds like, what are you saying, Jesus? We've got to be better than them? 
Well, there's no hope. They're the professionals. That's first appearance. But just hang on a second. Dig a little deeper. These Pharisees and scribes, yes, are highly respected in the community. Uh, yes, they are the ones that Jesus had the most similarity with. And yet, these are the people that repeatedly come up through Matthew's Gospel that Jesus reserved his severest criticism for these folk. Think of that. The people that knew their Bibles the best, Jesus condemned the fiercest. And it just keeps coming up through Matthew's Gospel. And in fact, now he would call them a brood of vipers. That's not the normal way you would address a, an esteemed, reputable, you know, religious group. It's like Jesus going along to a pastor's conference and saying, you're a slithering nest of King Browns. You know, this is, this is the way Jesus spoke to them. Now, this is alarming. I mean, if you had a neighbourhood of Pharisees, right, around your home, Pharisee on the left, Pharisee on the right, you could rest assured you're in a great neighbourhood, always safe. No shady drug deals are happening down your street. There will never be any wild parties, okay? You won't hear shouting against the kids. There'll never be some ruckus between the husband and the missus. And if there's a party, there'll never be more than 10 people. You can rest assured of that. And there'll be strictly 1.5 metre social distancing. Uh, the lawns will always be manicured. These were highly reputable people. But Jesus sees through their outward appearance. And Jesus calls them by their true colours. And so when he speaks to them, uh, later on in Matthew 23, Sarah quoted Matthew 23 before, but Matthew 23 is uh, one of the most severe speeches of Jesus, where he just takes aim at the scribes and Pharisees and lets rip. And he calls them for what they are. He says, despite your appearance, it is all a facade. It's a sham. You are whitewashed tombs. You are so concerned about your religious appearance, but there is an enormous discrepancy with your private life. And he takes them to task on a, a number of different issues. Uh, one of them was the way that they just had such an obsession with trivialities, straining out um, gnats but swallowing camels, he would say to them. Uh, the way that they would tie their herb rack in their kitchen pantry, but they would neglect the weighty matters of dealing justly and, and with mercy to oppressed and marginal people. It's okay because I tithe my herb rack. Yeah, but what about the way you treat the widow, the orphan, the foreigner? Jesus saw through to what they were really like. And the issue that he focused on, especially that's relevant to this passage, is the way that they externalized God's word. He would say to them, yes, uh, you have a great concern for how you appear. Oh, you love to look good in front of others. But the fact is, underneath... This is what he said, inwardly you are full of greed, self-indulgence, hypocrisy and lawlessness. How's that? He called these religious people for what they really were. He said, despite outward appearance, inwardly you fail the test. You're full of greed and self-indulgence, hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so Jesus puts his spotlight on the way that their righteousness is insufficient because they've just externalized it all. Now let me give you a couple of examples of that and you can see what Jesus is calling us as his kingdom followers to live up to. This tendency of the Pharisees to just externalize the commands it becomes apparent in the first two paragraphs following this statement from verse 20. So have a look at the rest of the chapter and you can see that it's divided into six examples that all have a similar pattern. Jesus is saying, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. You've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Six different topics that he raises. 
You can see what he's doing here. He's not saying, uh, you've read that it was written. So he's not having a go at what was written in the scriptures and then imposing himself as the new authority. He's saying, you've heard that it was said. You've heard that the Pharisees and the scribes, as those who sit in Moses' seat, interpreting the law to you and they have oral tradition. He says, I am drawing a contrast between what they've been saying and you've been hearing them say and what I say to you. And have a look at what he does in the first two examples. The first one is the command of murder, the sixth commandment in the Ten Commandments. Uh, you shall not murder, Exodus 20 verse 13. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now you get the impression that the Pharisees in their explanation of this are just wanting to reduce it down to a line in the sand you're not allowed to step over and that's killing, it's murder. But listen, it's okay to, uh, to get angry, to uh, vent a bit of road rage. It's okay to insult people. It's okay to treat people with contempt. Just don't unlock the gun cabinet and go and kill them. You get the impression that was the kind of oral teaching the Pharisees were perpetuating. And Jesus takes exemption with them. Exemption with them? I hope I got the right word there. He says, listen guys, it's not about murder. It's about what's going on in the heart. So don't just reduce it down to an external. Drive deeper. The issue is the anger in the heart. It's the way that we can uh, let unresolved conflict and offence continue to spill over. We'll just keep worshipping publicly, no problem, but not deal with broken relationships. Jesus says that's the problem. Everyone who's angry with their brother or sister and never fixes it. Those who insult, those who um, speak with such contempt, that's the start of the vicious cycle. And Jesus says, I, I'm not interested and people having a form of righteousness that is just a superficial, external appearance and show. He says, I'm driving to the heart. And so he says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. Be reconciled first. Do the work of fixing up unresolved offences. That's where murder starts in the heart. Jesus is calling for a standard of righteousness in his kingdom that is much deeper than just external performance. I oh, just don't murder. Uh-uh. No, in my kingdom, drill to the heart. I'm concerned about anger. Or go to the second example. The second one there is, is about adultery, verse 27. Uh, this was the seventh commandment in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. And again, you get the impression that the oral teaching of the Pharisees is so, okay, so what's important is that you do not engage in illicit uh, sexual intercourse with anybody else beside your married partner. But it's almost as if, yeah, but you can look, you can leer, you know, you can uh, run the video screen in your mind. You can objectify and depersonalize and use them for your own pleasure. Just don't book the hotel room. That's the impression you get is what the Pharisees' teaching was. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But he says, but I say to you, Oh, it's much deeper than just an, make sure you don't have some behavioural uh, misdemeanour. No, no, no. It starts in the heart. Everyone who looks at another woman with lustful intent, that you begin to depersonalise that woman, objectify them, begin to run the video of what you imagine you would like to do to satisfy your own cravings. That's where adultery starts, says Jesus. I'm looking for a standard of righteousness that's not just making sure you look squeaky clean on the outside. I'm looking for a standard of righteousness where the heart is pure, where as soon as there's the first uprisings of lust, you deal with it decisively, severely, radically, 
So Jesus uses that language of plucking out your eye and throwing it away, cutting off your hand and throwing it away. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? You see, Jesus passes the meet your mother test. He is somebody who is uh, faithful to the Old Testament revelation. He stands in continuity. He fulfills the law. And then he turns the attention to us and he says, do you pass the meet your mother test? Uh, uh, my followers need to be people that have a level of righteousness that is much superior to just outward performance. You are not to relax one of these commandments and teach others to do the same. No, no, no. You are to honour God's will expressed and the heart of the matter, not just the external. Jesus is calling for a, a mandatory, superior level of righteousness to even get a shoe in in his kingdom. Whew. He fulfills the law as the leader of the kingdom movement and he turns to his followers and says, now you need to fulfill the law too in my kingdom movement. Now, as we go through that teaching, it hits pretty hard, doesn't it? In fact, I imagine that there'll be a couple of responses that begin to rise in us. One is, I want that kind of righteousness. I'm imagining, as, as you're watching this this morning, the fact that you've logged on says that you, you already have some attachment here. You've already got some buy-in here with Jesus' kingdom. And so there's a part of you that would say, well, I want that level of righteousness. I don't want to just reduce it down to a mere show to, to make uh, religion some manageable human endeavour where we just get to be able to, to play the game and have others do the same to us. There's something in us that says, well, I want that level of righteousness. I want there to be way more than just external doing the right thing. I want there to be inward transformation so that my inclinations are changed, so that that seedbed where anger and lust can, can begin to germinate gets worked over, ploughed deep, and there's newness that springs up from the depths within so that there isn't anger, there isn't lust, and therefore there will never be murder or adultery because there's been heart transformation. The first response, I think, as we look at this is, I want that. I want that level of righteousness. Do you want that? But I think the second response is, and I am hopelessly unable to produce it. I could try, but I keep failing. And I'll fail again and again. And as much as I would want that level of heart transformation, I find in myself no capacity to change that hardwired inclination in my heart. What's the answer? Do you know in this passage, Jesus doesn't give the answer. <laughs> he, he just gives the entrance level requirement. And he's not kidding. He's not pulling our leg. He's not playing games. He's saying, no, this is entrance level requirement. You need a righteousness that's better than the professionals. Because inwardly, all is not what it seems with them. I'm calling you to deeper heart transformation. But he doesn't tell us how. How are we to make that righteousness our own? How is that to be birthed in us? How are we to attain it? Jesus does not answer that question of how. Not here. Not yet. I can't finish this message without trying to give some of the answer. So here's three directions you've got to look. Firstly, look backwards. If you're asking, how does that righteousness get worked out in me so I become a new person with a new set of inclinations, a new set of desires who delights in doing the will of God? 
then the first thing to do is to look backwards. Jesus says he has come to fulfill the law, the will of God. And so all that system in the law of sacrifices, he fulfills it. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, all our failings. He is the great high priest who makes a once for all sacrifice for all our failings, makes purification for our sins and then sat down. And he is the one who fulfills the prophets. So old Jeremiah prophesied saying, The days are coming when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts, said Jeremiah. That's what he prophesied. Ezekiel said, chapter 36, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll remove your heart of stone, hard heart, and I'll give you a responsive, a supple, a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my just decrees. Look backwards and you can see, ah, Jesus is here to fulfill the law of God, to bring all of that system, that, that picture of sacrifice to its completion in a once for all sacrifice. He is here to fulfill the prophets, all those promises of a new day when the law will be worked into our hearts and he'll put his spirit in us and that will give us the capacity to obey. So look backwards, look sideways. Do you remember that time in John's Gospel, chapter 3? When a Pharisee called Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, plagued with questions, provoked with curiosity, and Jesus says to him straight out, unless you are born again, you'll never see the kingdom. He says you have to be born again of the Spirit to even enter the kingdom of God. That is the way that we enter the Holy Spirit rebirths us within we are regenerated within and with the the work of the spirit all of a sudden there is the capacity now to delight in the will of god and then not only look backwards not only look sideways but look forwards this jesus who is laying this down for his kingdom followers for you and i and, and he's not minimizing it He's saying, I don't want you to reduce this. I want you to take this seriously. He says, I fulfill the law. I want you to fulfill the law. This Jesus, who, who gives us that standard, goes to the cross and dies for every failure and every rebellion and every iniquity. And he rises and he sends his spirit And his Holy Spirit now empowers us to be the people that he calls us to be. And so the Apostle Paul will write later on and say that we can be found in Christ, not with a righteousness of our own that comes from the law. And Paul should know he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, we can be found in Christ, not with the righteousness of our own that comes from our attempts to obey the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That's in Philippians 3. In Romans 8, he'll say that the righteous requirement of the law, God's will laid down in the Hebrew Scriptures, that righteous requirement can now be fulfilled in us who are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is the how. Jesus' work in his cross and resurrection, in his work by the Spirit as he sends the Spirit of God upon his followers. Jesus comes and he says, I stand in continuity, I fulfill the law, and now I call you as my kingdom followers to fulfill the law. He doesn't lower that standard, but he grants the wherewithal to live it out by the power of the cross in his cleansing blood, by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so, friends, as I wrap up now, I want to call you, if, if you've logged in this morning and you're watching and you've been able to stay with me through this message, I want to call you 
to enter Jesus' kingdom. I, I extend Jesus' invitation to you to enter the kingdom that Jesus commenced. And, and he lays it out clear, the standard of righteousness. So I invite you, come to Jesus, confessing your failure, confessing your need, asking him to confer his righteousness, to gift you with his righteousness that you may enter his kingdom and be a follower of the King. To those of us who are watching this who are followers of King Jesus, and we would say of ourselves, yes, we are part of this kingdom that Jesus has brought in, and gladly so, we gladly declare our allegiance. You know, this passage uh, hits us hard, doesn't it? Because it says something about the attitude that we need to have to the Old, Old Testament, to the Hebrew Scriptures. It says something about the attitude that we need to have to this will of God expressed throughout the whole of Scripture. We are not to be those who soften it and relax it and allow permission here and exemption clauses there. Jesus calls us, fellow Christian, to a level of righteousness that surpasses what was popular in Jesus' day. And so may we be those who look to Jesus and say, would you work your righteousness through us? May we be those who seek you and invite you to do a deep work in us, to purify the deepest parts, to renew the deepest parts, that we will be people who are filled with the fruits of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ to the praise and the glory of God. Amen. After Sarah closes with a benediction, I invite you to bring up those discussion questions and to chat about them together in your Zoom Connect group. I I pray there'll be a fruitful time for you as you just mull over this incredible passage of Scripture. God bless you, church. Well, today we have been reminded of the challenge of Jesus' teaching and the great hope we have in him as his kingdom disciples. I want to leave you this morning with the ironic blessing from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Next week, we're going to have our first post-service Zoom church-wide meeting. And so I want to encourage you to look out for your emails this week for more details about how to log on and join us for that. And we look forward to seeing you all next week.